right, we've touched, we've touched on the database. Uh, so this is the annual update uh, from uh, Stuart Everett, who is going to talk uh, about the uh, second Central Equine database uh, and give his annual update. And he's had some interesting and exciting developments. Stuart, over to you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Stuart Everett. I'm the CEO of Equine Register, and I can't believe I was invited back after last year. It's fantastic to be here, but we've had a crazy year, and everyone has been incredibly busy. That's PIOs, DEFRA, and particularly our team as well, who have been desperately trying to get the data space sorted out and out to scratch. Now, this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, what I'm going to expect from it. And, uh, but I'd like to also refresh our memories a little bit about what it is, and what it does, and why it does it. Because that's quite important to understanding how this all works. Now, if you look at uh, the screen there, you'll see we are, we are a separate company. We provide national identification, registration, and traceability services to the airplane industry and government. And they are some of the sectors that we deal with and have uh, applications for and delivery of data to. <coughs> now, the CD itself, we provide and manage for DEFRA, and DEFRA is our customer. Uh, it's, I'm not going to read stuff off the screen to you, but the last few points that are incredibly important, it's leading the way in the whole of data at the second. It has been developed completely freshly, completely to be flexible and dynamic, and to meet the needs of the 21st century and 21st century technology. You've got uh, sophisticated business rules and policies that deliver conflict resolution, and you've got the ability to start to plug applications, devices, platforms into it as well. As things emerge, 10 years ago, there was no such thing as smartphones. So, why the CED? Last year, that's what I said, why the CED? There it is in black and white. But actually, it's now recognised as well by industry and government as an important tool to underpin exciting new opportunities. So, particularly with the, uh, the new council that's been set up, there is the ability to start to say, can we do these things, can we do that? It's important to get behind it. Now, what's the point of it? Initially, the point of it is very much food chain safety, disease management, and help people get reunited with their lost and stolen animals. Now we'll come on slightly to that as well. Now there's also, this will be part of the livestock strategy going forward, I understand, but I think John Bourne's going to talk to you more about that in a second. But disease management can only happen if animals are ID properly. And this is where it all comes back around in a big circle to owners, to data, to seed, to PIOs, to people updating and keeping the data up to date. And there's going to be some very, very easy, simple tools to enable that to happen. Now, where are we with the Central Airplane Database? There's the question. Uh, the good news is, as the Minister said, it's operational, it's alive. Um, already there have been impacts, positive impacts on the Food Standards Agency vets that have been logging into this. They have found things out um, that are really important to the defence of the food chain. But I thought I'd give you some facts as well. So, we now have some data on that. The 1.2 million records, there, will, there may be more. Um, we have, uh, we have a number of things coming in and out. The records change the whole time. In fact, this morning, records have gone up more. More PIOs are coming in the door right now. But remember, the system only works properly if everything is on. And that's horses, ponies, donkeys, hybrids, and yes, we even have circuits. And the complete system needs to include derogated records and microchips, as this is really important to welfare and food chain safety. Now, we're lucky in this country to be blessed with 81 passport issuing organisations. <laughs> and uh, that actually is uh, 68 PIOs that are active and 13 that are inactive. They've uh, either moved over or given up or actually in some cases been shut down. But um, the next stat is really important. Only 32% of the horses on there currently are ruled out of the food chain. Now, as owners, you can rule your animal out of the food chain at any point. Vets can rule their animals out of the food chain when they've got uh, when they issue controlled drugs. But if you do not want your horse in the food chain, 
Rule it out, but don't just rule it out on the password. Tell the PIO. It's really important you feed the information back. PIO, updates the central point database, and then people can log in and see what's going on. The next stat, stat is really important. Only 47% of the horses have a microchip recorded. Now, this can be for several reasons. But actually, a really important reason is that you may have had a microchip put into the passport. You may have gone out and microchipped the horse legally and for the right reasons. But you haven't notified the PIO. Unless you notify the PIO that's happened, you cannot go to the central records. And that's really important because you will not get reunited with your lost or stolen animal. So if we look at uh, something that everyone's been uh, vying for, they've wanted us to do for ages, it's the Equine Register Public Chip Check. Now this was asked the question that we do this by DEFRA and by the sector itself. So essentially, this will be on our website and it will be going live very, very shortly, probably next, next few weeks. Um, you will go to the public chip chat and you'll see it on the homepage of the website. It's incredibly easy to use. You enter a microchip number at the top and you will receive basic information about, about the animal. There is also, very importantly, in the top right hand corner, a button that says no microchip question mark. This will help. If you want it, this will have information about how do I get a microchip into my horse, how do I do this, how do I register it, who do I do it with. This is where to get behind things. We can start to channel people into talking to their vets, talking to everybody else. Now, there's also uh, work with the sector that's going on, but more importantly, it's free, and they've demanded that everyone demand it. it's free, and it's the right thing. It's free. it's free for everybody to use this, and it's free to get behind it. It gives public access to credible data. People have heard about the CBD, but actually the CBD itself, when it was originally uh, tendered, was a closed system. It's a closed system for food standards registered for local authority training standards officials, for the DEFRA and the default, for the PIOs themselves. It doesn't allow public access. This is what this allows, and it allows the data to be kept up to date and gives people confidence in the data. Now, if we look at what you can get from the chip chat, You will notice none of the information that comes back on these reports is personal data. This is unbelievably important because it is therefore data protection, regulation, and GDPR compliant. But it does give you a chance to start to have a look at comparing documents in real time. And everything is funneled back through the PIO. If you have any issues, any questions, anything, there's the PIO information, talk to the PIO. They will go through the checks and balances that we need to do. Vets can see food chain status in the, in the field. That's been an incredibly important thing to go on. And if you're being sold an animal and you're getting <coughs> cheap documents, you can do a basic check against them now. So you'll notice this record has no alerts. There's a big green zero there. So let's look at one with some alerts. Now, there are two alerts on this record. And what we'll have a look at now is some data that goes with the alerts. One of the things that we can get up to date today is the fact the horse is dead. This is really because there has been evidence of microchips and documents being moved around from dead animals. The recycling of this cannot happen. It's incredibly it's bad for all manner of reasons. Um, this is a basic check and balance against it. There are also some other alerts that we can put on there with the help of animals. Animal reporting missing. There's the big one. My animal's gone. How on earth are you going to find this again? Now you can get an alert up from it if you log into the owner. We, we clear your uh, data, we check it. My, my documents are missing. One. There we are. The documents that you've got in your hand are either stolen or they're wrong. Passport held with keeper. You'll notice there are red and amber there. These are different because passport held with keeper isn't the end of the world, but it's a good note. We found out that Sometimes horses get sold from yards that aren't supposed to be sold from yards. And if the documents are with them, it's just a caveat emptor, a buyer beware. There are multiple documents associated with this horse. This is something that has happened already with the Food Standards Agency. In some documents, it's in the food chain. In some documents, it's out of the food chain. Immediately, that makes a big difference to things. So what can you do if you can't find your microchip? Well, the first thing we say is, have a look and see if you've typed the number incorrectly uh, and have another go. But if not, check that it's registered with a PIO, as I said at the beginning. So when will the chip checker be ready? 
I estimate probably then. But we're running some last checks on it right now, and that will have be the start of a process that grows and grows. That's pretty much it. I've had my one-minute sign. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, good progress being made. Um, we're going to take our next paper from John Bourne from DEFRA looking at livestock traceability and then there'll be a question time. So John, if you'd like to come up and give your paper on livestock traceability. Am I coming over there? Yeah, you come yeah. over here. Horses matter. You don't need, need me to tell you that. And you've heard from the previous speakers how they matter to government, how they matter to the economy, and how they matter to individuals. Um, I'm going to be speaking uh, slightly more around sort of the broader picture here um, and surprise you all by talking not entirely around horses, which will probably make me unpopular. But I know that horses really do matter to individuals. My mother is 84. She's ridden a horse nearly every day of her life and spent the last 25 years riding the same horse. Uh, very sadly, that relationship came to an end in January, so you can imagine she's feeling fairly bereft. And I always think that probably much more bereft than if it had been me who had been put down in January. <laughs> um, and horses have sort of, in government, one sort of have interesting characteristics. They have characteristics that are quite linked to uh, cats and dogs, and they have characteristics that are quite linked to sort of other larger animals in the farming community. And I'm going to be talking slightly more about the latter for the next few minutes. Um, first of all, where are we now? Um, we have, uh, uh, as you just heard, the fourth one, but we've got three main um, uh, traceability and ID systems. Uh, the, the one on cattle uh, was first designed in about 1995 or thereabouts. Uh, and was a reaction to the BSE crisis. It's been continuously developed from then, um, and it's not all paper-based now as it was to start with. You can identify, as many of you will know, your cattle online or order a passport. However, underlying it is still quite a clunky system. There are a lot of people employed in working terms, for example, who receive passports from slaughterhouses, have to load each number up manually onto a computer system, and it still runs off a green screen computer system. Some of you may remember those and probably haven't seen one for a long time. Um, but it produces a very good service for farmers. Uh, uh, it has a fantastic telephone helpline um, and uh, it's very user friendly from that point of view, but it can't be said to be the most efficient. Um, the one for pigs is uh, owned and delivered by, the, uh, by AHDB. Uh, the, the levy board. Um, uh, it was originally designed when there was a pig, an independent pig levy board, and they did it independently of government. Um, it might not totally surprise you to know that that system is also very popular with its users, because it was sort of designed partly by the users, or people who represented them. Um, but it doesn't do individual animals, it does batches. Uh, the one uh, on the bottom left, sheep and goats, uh, was designed in response to the EU's regulations on uh, electronic ID, uh, the first species to, ha to, to have compulsory electronic ID. Uh, I think many people would think it was a pity they didn't start with cattle, but it was partly a response to the problems that we had with foot and mouth disease in 2000. We found it very hard to know where our sheep were. Um, when we put it together, it, is, it meets the minimum legal requirements. Um, it's probably fair to say that it only just meets them, and it's probably fair to say it was designed to be the least cost means of meeting them. It probably isn't entirely a surprise then that from the user point of view, they feel it doesn't do much for them, uh, and it's not very popular. And um, in this context, I think I should also say that from our point of view in disease control, 
it's not perfect for us either. Um, and we'll sort of come back to that theme in a minute around sort of who designs these systems and what are the drivers behind them. Uh, you've now got, as you've just heard from Stuart, a shiny new system um, uh, which has been designed with rather different principles um, uh, and much more input from users. Um, uh, and I hope, as we'll come to in a minute, that that will prove better for you as users as well as delivering what we need and meeting uh, legal requirements. Um, many of you probably have several of those species um, and if you do you will know that you have to interact with those four different systems. Um, it would be easier for those of you who do have several species if you only had one system to interact with. Um, in addition uh, on the cattle front uh, the EU uh, regulations are changing and by summer 2019 we are supposed to have a system that is enabled for EID. We don't actually have to use it at that point but it should be enabled and clearly uh, I think we can all predict that it will become compulsory to use it uh, in due course. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, I hope that we have learned some of the lessons over the last 20 30 years, so we are trying to approach the next stage in a slightly different way. Um, Simon Hall, who leads the project, has put together uh, a large group of people who are the traceability design uh, user group, chaired by John Cross, uh, and Jeanette and Jan uh, sit on that, and that's quite an interesting point. I don't think at any time in the past that you would have had equine representatives when talking about livestock identification in DEFRA. Um, and we're trying to do this differently. We're trying to learn the lessons from projects more broadly. You can either look at this as a, uh, a project to put a new IT system in place, or you can say, what, you can do what's known as a benefits-driven project. How do I maximize the benefits that I get out of what I've got to do? And uh, so my background is on projects and uh, uh, that's what we've tried to do, for example, on HS2 and, 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 and similar projects. Um, so we've put a group together and said, what is it that you would like to see out of an ID system? We know what we need to see as government in terms of disease control. Uh, we know what the regulations say, but what can it do for you? And I think that that group's been meeting for a year now um, and has had a huge impact on what this system might in the future look like. Um, it is very much co-creation rather than government coming up with an answer, consulting you, um, uh, taking some account of what you say and then going ahead largely was it with what it had first designed because you're too far down the road to do a radical change. So we very much tried to make sure that your views are in here on the ground floor. Uh, and as I say, the equine sector has been hugely influential in that. Um, and Tim's been involved as well. Uh, so, uh, this is about data, as Stuart said. Um, you, uh, in a sense, are leading this with your CED because you have the data now and you can start to think about how you might use it. Um, and there are issues with data rules and data sharing, but those, like all rules and things, those are there to be overcome. Um, and what we want from this livestock ID is a system which owns good quality data on all livestock. Um, so you actually have a, a fairly shiny new example anyhow, so you're going to be sort of at the end of the queue here because in a sense you're not the one where the pressures are greatest, but that's quite good news because you can learn from everyone else too and from your own experiences with the CED. Um, but there will be, so you have good quality data, government will use it for the purposes it needs, you and the other sectors can use it for the purposes you need. And the sort of areas where it's really helpful and you will, you will discover what you can use it for um, and you will have ideas that we will not have. But clearly things around genetics, not so much in your world, productivity, but standards, innovation, uh, 
uh, integration of in, in the livestock world of supply chains, etc., is really important. I imagine that in your world it would largely re around genetics and performance and things are going to be more important than other things, but um, I'm not the expert on this. The really important point is how do we enable you to use the data rather than say we just want data from you? That gives you much more of a buy-in to what we're doing. Um, and so I hope that this will be uh, a, a very different way of doing livestock identification. And whichever sector you're involved in, and you may well be involved in more than one, it will be of benefit to you as well as to us. Because one of the clear messages back, particularly from the sheep and goat world, is um, uh, you have this system, we have to give you data, it's no use to us, it's a real pain in the neck. And we quite want to change that dynamic and make sure that actually you are the ones who want to use this data. You're the one who actually find this system beneficial. We will definitely as well uh, in disease outbreaks, um, but hopefully those will be few and far between. So that's sort of my message I really wanted to get across. And I think that it's, uh, the CED is already a long way down that road. Uh, and as I say, you may say, why are we putting a new database in place when you've just got a shiny new one? It's fair to say the equine world is not the driver for having a single all-species database, uh, but clearly, um, uh, which is why you won't be the first ones to go on it, um, uh, but once we have one, it makes sense to use that single platform, uh, but that's some years down the road. Next steps, because I probably ran out of time, um, uh, some of you may have read or heard what the Secretary of State said at the NFU conference. Um, uh, we need still to work on uh, sort of the, the target operating model. Uh, um, uh, we need to make sure that we put funding, etc., in place. There is real commitment, I think, at ministerial level uh, to this uh, proposal. Um, we haven't quite tied it all down, uh, so I can't say when it will start exactly. But that is the concept behind it, and we are convinced that that is a much better way of doing things for the future uh, whenever it starts. Thank you very much. Right, ladies and gentlemen, two interesting papers that have direct influence for all of you. So I'm sure there are some questions, points that you might like to ask either Stuart or John. Yeah. Hi, hang on, there's a, there's a microphone. If you could say who you are, that would be really helpful. Please. Ruth Staines, Caspian Horse Society. Um, could Stuart provide the PIOs and perhaps other organisations with uh, an overview and publicity of what the CED does so we can use that to inform our members uh, and owners? Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we can, but actually what the best thing to do is probably talk to Martin at DEFRA, Martin Jenkins, because the CED is DEFRA's, very much DEFRA's baby. Uh, but no, it sounds like a great idea, and I'm Thank sure you. Martin will be behind it. Um. Keith Meldrum. Is it on? Uh, Keith Meldrum, Veterinary Advisor, World Horse Welfare. Stuart, a question for you. It follow up, follows up our discussion two, day, uh, two weeks ago about accessibility to the data on the database. Uh, and I'm talking now in the connection to the slaughter industry because at the moment they're having some difficulties in knowing exactly what data is on the database when an animal or a carcass of an animal is condemned or it cannot go forward for human consumption. They can ask the PIO, but at the moment they can't get to you guys and to ask why a particular animal has been blocked. And I know that that may be sorted out in due course, but at the moment there's a problem, and will that be sorted out in, in the future? And a comment in passing, I do think it's important that those of you that involved with DEFRA and with the database in particular, talk to the slaughter industry. There are not that many operators, but they want to talk to you so that this system, when it's up and running, works and works well. Um, right. Uh, that's, a lot of that is a DEFRA question again. Um, you need to talk to, uh, to, to Martin, to, to John, uh, to say, can they get access? But with the public chip checker, that immediately gives everybody access to food chain status and an alert of whether there are multiple documents associated with an animal. With regard to a right of recourse and finding out more information and accessibility for other groups, I can't answer that. Do you want to take that, John? Um, um, Keith, I, I, 
I, I can't answer that now. I mean, you need to talk to Martin. Um, my, uh, so you, you, they can find the, the simple material information about whether it is or isn't in the food chain. If they want to know why it's not in the food chain, I suspect that may get more complicated in terms of data, etc. So I think I, I sort of wouldn't want to, 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 to guess at an answer. Uh, Keith, I never run away from you. <laughs> I, I mean, I, speaking as someone involved in the traceability design user group, I, I think there is, there has been uh, the, the concern that as far as DEFRA initially were concerned, it was only, if you like, part to the farm gate. After that was somebody else's problem. I think now that there is a realisation it's all the way through to Absolutely. the slaughterhouse and Absolutely. stuff like that, because that's really, really important. Miles, and then in the front. Miles Williams Noble, European Federation of Farriers Associations. Could I ask to drill down a little bit into that 1.2 million records figure? Does it include those horses which are shown as having died? Does it include those which are not shown as having died, but which are aged over 50? Um, and do, does it include multiple records for any animal that's been registered with two PIOs? Uh, what, the, the basic question is, how many live horses, equides, are there in the country? Okay, there are about, uh, there's about 1.2 million. Uh, we haven't got an exact number on it because it's changing the whole time, but it's about 1.2 million live. There's also uh, people reported... Uh, dead horses in there. We keep that information. I think it's for up to two years and then that is filed somewhere else. And on the uh, aged horses, what is it? It's 30, is it 35? I think it's over 35. They're moved as well. Um, I'm not sure that is a, that's a policy thing and you need to clear that with DEFRA when they get moved out as a kind of just being too old. But the important thing about the CED now is that it is so much more accurate and there is so much more ability to actually trace the life of a horse rather than just guess. Oh, it's 35, probably dead. Uh, that's not really that helpful to people. So there is the opportunity to do this now. The data is becoming very, very clean. Uh, the access is available. It's up to you guys to work out what you need to do and talk to DEFRA about it. And generically, one of the issues whenever you put in a new data system is uh, the, 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 the rules you put about the data that you, the old data you import into it, which will always have issues. Uh, and problems, because actually that's one of the reasons you're putting a new data system in place. So the answer is, uh, there was quite a lot of bad quality data, I think the Minister said in his speech. Uh, we have done our best to uh, cleanse that, which is one reason it's taken time. Um, if you're asking me, can I be absolutely sure that there are no elements of bad quality data in there, I think that's hugely unlikely. Yep. There will be some. <laughs> it will be much better than it was. And as this system then goes over time, and generations of horses go through it, it will self-cleanse as absolutely, well, because the, the rules and the system are now tighter. So the 1.2 million is about roughly three years by the end of the year. Absolutely. Yes, this has been one of the things. I mean, on old Ned, I think the data was up to 1.5 million, but tons of those, rec that's gone. Uh, this is very, very much more accurate and up-to-date. But again, it is only as accurate as the data the PIO supplies. Uh, so, F final question there, otherwise we're running out of time, I'm afraid. Hi, Dave Jones, I'm the uh, National Lead for Policing for Wildlife, Crime and Rural Affairs. Um, support what you're doing. I've just you one much. question, how involved are we in that from a livestock theft point of view? We obviously from our site have a lots of experience of tracing things, um, and if there isn't, we would like to offer some of that. Um, I guess if you're asking how involved you are, the answer is not enough, um, um, almost by definition, or you wouldn't have asked the question. Uh, so thank you is the answer. Um, 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 I'll take that back. Uh, it's just, if I may just have one little thing to that. We've been, I believe that DEFRA have been asked by some body of police, but I'm not sure which body, if they can get access. There's the public chip checker up there, which of course, part of this is to do that, and then it's just about having a chat to them, because now the system's there. And it would be fantastic. It makes complete sense, doesn't it? So, yeah. Good. Well, apologies for those of you who put your hands up, but we've run out of time, which is always a good sign. So thank you very much, Stuart and John. Really good session. Thank you. Thank you.
Probably the most shocking thing was that it was like a graveyard with the walking dead. They had so many lice on them that we had to, you know, to do a full body prep to get rid of all the, the parasites before we could even start treating them. The scale of it seemed enormous. I think it opened the eyes of many members of the British public who hadn't seen animal cruelty before.